nobody's going to wake up one day and flip flip a light switch and and pay to play is going to be done. It's got to be unique, innovative solutions. It's got to be investment in communities and community organizations. It's got to be the right people. Can't be like sending you know somebody in and saying we're going to do it this way. Like soccer is happening. You know, like soccer's happening in different ways in different forms at the youth level. Today's topic is a heady one. Overcoming the beast of pay to play in youth soccer in the United States is what we're talking about today. And if accessibility and equity in youth soccer is an important topic to you, then I'm going to ask for a very small favor. Pressing the like button will tell the YouTube algorithm to show this video to more people. And it's such an easy thing to do when we're talking about such an important topic. So, If diversity, equity, and inclusion are words that bother you or scare you, I'll challenge you right now to watch this interview and let me know if your mind changes at all in the comments. And if you want more content like this, please consider subscribing to the channel. But for now, let's get to the all-important topic at hand. What's up, everyone? We have a very special guest today. It is a disclaimer. He's my cousin, but I'm very excited to have him on the channel. Simon Landau joins us, who is the co-founder of Open Goal Project. Simon, how are you? I'm great. I when we were when we were growing up as kids, I never thought that we would be talking over a computer on a soccer podcast, but here <laughs> we are. So there must have been some gene that just made us love this game. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't exactly. know what happened. <laughs> so for anyone, probably most people that aren't familiar with yourself or Open Goal, you just kind of introduce what that is and how you got involved or where the idea came from. Yeah, so Open Goal Project, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization. We're based in Washington, D.C. Um, we uh, saw a real gap in, you know, the American youth soccer landscape for uh, kids from low-income families, specifically and generally, you know, black kids, uh, Latino kids, kids from immigrant households who just have been left on the sidelines really from um, kind of the traditional travel ecosystem, if you will. Um, And so I grew up playing soccer, as you know, and um, my co-founder, Amir Lowry, who grew up playing soccer and also played in the MLS. We came together in 2015 in DC, kind of coming at it from different angles. And we just decided something had to be done for a number of kids in our community that we were working with who had, you know, significant talent, significant potential, um, but just honestly didn't have anywhere to play, whether it was because they had opportunities, but it was too expensive for their families, or they just honestly didn't even know about the travel soccer landscape or transportation issues, language barriers, all those kind of things. So Um, When we started in 2015, we were actually a small fundraising organization that was raising money to to essentially um, help scholarship and cover fees for kids in our neighborhood, in our community to play on travel teams, help cover their fees, help cover their out-of-town fees. And for a couple of years, we did that. Um, And as we scaled and as more and more kids that we started to see needed that opportunity. And also as we started to see that wasn't really a sustainable model to try to fit kind of a square peg in a round hole, if you will. Um, You know, we started developing our own holistic programming and uh, today in 2021, we have served thousands of kids. Almost all our programming is in DC. Um, We have executed programming in California, Um, But the core programming here is, you know, everything that would normally be associated with high level soccer at the youth level, you know, academy teams, ID camps, uh, strength and conditioning training. We execute all those camps, clinics. We execute all that programming at a really high level, 100 percent free of charge for the kids that we work with. So we see it as an opportunity. to connect with the kids who have been left on the sideline. And we see it as soccer as a vehicle to, you know, um, push them and push the kids we worked with to higher education, greater life experiences, and just give them an opportunity to reach their full potential in soccer and, and in life. So. 
I know a lot of people that will watch these types of channels will try and focus it on what it means for maybe national team success. And there's always talk about like, if our best athletes just played soccer, we'd be a yeah. world power. But I think what also gets lost is just the the actual human element of what this is actually doing to help these people in these communities. Can you just set the stage for maybe give us an example of someone that has been impacted by a program like this and what it actually means for their lives, their development, maybe their schools and what something like Open Goal has led them to? Yeah, I mean, so before I even go into that, I'd comment on what you you just started to say, which is, I mean, anybody on U.S. soccer Twitter can see that anytime there's a big loss or when the World Cup, it's immediately like it's a knee jerk. Uh, it's pay to play. And that is a huge element of it. Um, we over the past six years of doing this work real true grassroots work going into neighborhoods going into households meeting with kids meeting with families there's a lot more to it than just it costs a lot of money to play soccer um, that is a big reason uh, don't get me wrong but um you know at the base level there are all these barriers to entry that you know are shrinking the pool that trickles up to the national team pool right so i don't think it's fair to say you know our team is, you know, none of our national team players would be playing if everybody, that's not true. They're good players, right? But um, at the end of the day, we're, if you start with 20% of the population only having access to entry, then you're missing out on 80% who might or might not, you know, have the ability and potential and capacity to advance. Um, to your question, though, so we see ourselves as soccer organization, high level soccer organization, but we also see ourselves as a community organization. And, you know, any of the, anybody who's watching this, who grew up playing soccer or who knows someone who grew up playing soccer, or just played a sport at a high level, a competitive level, you know, knows what it means for your personal development, um, you know, particularly for kids. And then when you're talking about the kids that we work with, you know, kids who are from, um, immigrant households or single parent households, for the most part, low income families, you know, the the um, the opportunities, the structure, the lessons that that they're gaining through just having access to participate in a high level program, just like, you know, any other travel program teaches them a lot about, you know, everything from the game to soft skills like leadership and motivation and things like that, that, you know, to you or I who had access to not just soccer, but we could go to summer camp, right? We could, mm -hmm. you know, have the resources to participate in different kind of community programs. Um, you know, the kids we work with love the game and it's an opportunity to, to just position that as, almost a carrot and a vehicle to, to help them see more. Um, we've had kids, a number of kids, we're about to put out a, a little clip today on social of um, the next in line of our student athletes who are gonna be the first in their families to go to college or university. Um, he's gonna be playing at Marymount University next, next fall or this fall. Um, and that's what we really want to happen, right? We're, we're not pushing our kids to go pro. There are a million people who are doing that kind of thing. If we saw a kid who had the real true potential to get there, we would um, push them in that direction. But in reality, we see it as a way that, that they can stay on course, both in life and in education and, and continue to do something they love while they do it. So. So if that's the kids, I've also seen some of the videos that you guys have put out about the parents in the communities and just what it means to have people trusted that are near them where they're spending time instead of doing something else within lower income communities. What does that look like for you over six or so years, just being yeah. ingrained in the community that you're helping? I mean, even taking a step back, not even just talking about like youth soccer as a construct, what we've seen by eliminating any fees, right? Like there are programs that offer 
So there are community programs that offer free soccer, right? And those are great. They're normally executed by, you know, people with not a lot of soccer experience or, you know, they're um, volunteers, which is, again, it's great. You know, the equipment might not be the same as, you know, an MLS Academy, for example, right? And, and it fills a space. What we're trying to do is replicate that exact high-level Academy experience but just remove the fees. Um, and going back to what I was saying, we've seen that other programs have nominal fees, right? Like $100, $20 per month. And regardless, if there is a fee, it's going to price someone out. And, yeah. and people kind of, you know, I think there's a very large hurdle and obstacle for people understanding that construct, because if you're making $100,000 a year, you don't see why a hundred dollars a year would price someone out. If you're making ten thousand dollars a year and you have four kids, you know it would eliminate that opportunity. Um, but what we've seen by eliminating the fees is we've removed kind of the competitive element of it within the club and within the organization. Um, you know, working with kids when we were initially putting them on other teams, travel teams, when, when you're paying big money to compete, you inherently, a lot of the parents see it as an investment, right? They see it as an investment in potentially getting their kids to college, you know, um, on a, on a scholarship of some, some capacity. And inherently then there's, there's like a family, um, or player, you know, families who are looking at players and almost like you're a team, but there's competition within the team amongst the families. By eliminating it, we've created this really unique culture, I think, that everybody's pulling for each other. Everybody at each level, all the families see what we're doing, see that the kids have come through the program or now coming back to work with the program. Um, and it just it it's something that it's it's hard to explain because if you've participated in any pay to play soccer system you won't see kind of what that's like without that element unless you're in this kind of environment this kind of community so okay. it means a lot to them i mean it's access right but it's also a community family feel that is around something that they love too, right? We have, you know, I think 90% of our kids and families are from Central America, South America. Um, and it's, you know, it's a game that obviously is a world's game, but for them here in the States, it's it's the game that they love that they really haven't had access to in the past because yeah. of our system. So. so I know you've had some partnerships in the past. You've worked in Washington, D.C. You've worked outside sometimes. What does the scalability and the business model for this actually look like going forward? Yeah, so um, we have taken a totally different approach to the youth soccer business model, as you said. Um, you know, I think traditionally that's the first question is how, how is it going to be paid for, right? Um, so we kind of see ourselves a bit of a chameleon in terms of what we are and the different kind of partners we can go after. So, you know, we, we have um, our nonprofit 501c3 side, right? So we aggressively pursue and have received funding from foundations, government funding, right? Um, organizations that probably aren't really that interested or concerned with like, the quality of the soccer yep. um, and are more looking at kind of social missions. You know, we have, we have a, a program under our umbrella that is specifically designed to provide the kids that we work with, with high level fitness training because the health gap is so large, right? So we give them fitness and nutrition training. That's kind of a core program that we go after grant funding with. We also have, as I said, we're, kind of branding ourselves and, um, you know, see ourselves as 
a social impact soccer brand, if you will. Um, and so we've had several corporate partners and we're continuing to aggressively search out corporate partners that see our mission and believe in, you know, bringing more equity and diversity to youth soccer in the States. Um, we think that that's a lane that'll continue to progress as we move closer to the World Cup and the topic of, you know, this massive topic continues to be talked about. Um, in 2018, when when the U.S. men's missed the World Cup, everybody started talking about the issue, right? And we had started doing the work prior to then. Um, and then we also go after, obviously, individual donors. Anyone who's listening, you can donate on our website. Um, um, but, you know, people who really resonate with our mission um, and who know that this is a huge issue and area of need within the youth soccer system. Um, so scalability wise, you know, we see it as we have different programs. As I mentioned, we have programs that we could replicate like that in another you know, city if uh, like a college ID camp, right? Where, you know, those are traditionally $500 for kids to participate in. Um, you know, our ID camps that we've had in DC to this point are you know, completely free. We bring in college coaches for identification. The more long-term vision is replicating our DCFC Academy model, which is the free academy club team, which would require significant investment, right? Continues to require significant investment. Um, and that's kind of a model that we see over the next decade that we could potentially replicate in another city or another market but that would really require having the right people in place, having the right community contacts in place, having the right partners in place, because it's not, you know, it's not um, a one off. It's something that really this stuff is takes a lot. It takes a lot of uh, time. It takes a lot of personal you know, communication. It takes the right people, as I mentioned. So we were really focused on kind of where we are right now, but we do think it's everywhere we've been, you know, we did, we have executed programming in California and the markets that we worked with there for our camps, you know, we would go out in um, the San Joaquin Valley and, and those communities are very different from Washington DC in terms of urban versus rural, but the challenges and the issue, they manifest in different ways. It's the same issue, right? access equity um, around youth soccer. So we hope and we see opportunities kind of all over to, to continue to push the envelope. And, you know, we, as we move closer to 2026, um, we really hope that and, and express the need at the base grassroots level for organizations corporations, organ, uh, you know, governments to see that, that this is really, you know, an issue that needs to be tackled. All right. So you mentioned the scalability there and talked a little bit about what this looks like versus pay to play and going into the 2026 World Cup. Is the goal at some point envisioning that this is how it works across the country? Or do you think the pay to play model is something that can maybe be modified a bit to fit into that access and equity that you're talking about? So I think that there's kind of multiple prongs to that. So first of all, I think that pay to play, will it's not gonna go away. It's, it's just like, like it, it, I wasn't around when soccer, youth soccer started here, maybe late 80s, maybe I was just getting born, right? But, um, you know, I, I, it's always been hand in hand, right? Like, it's not like there were a couple of different ways to do it. So I think, you know, when we talk with different people, there we've talked to hundreds of people over the years who are starting their own soccer thing or work on their own soccer thing. And it's all the same model. It's all that, that model. And, and, understandably so because it's the way it's been done right um 
I think at the core, so first, there does need to be, um, I forgot what word you used. but A modification. Modification, yeah. yeah. I think modification is right within that landscape for some of it because there's just a complete lack of understanding um, of, of what of what it will take to level the playing field, right? Like, um, and I guess and that's what I'm is, asking is like, help us understand what leveling yeah. the playing field looks like. Yeah. Like, you know, with any club, most clubs, or organizations, I mean, to this point, they're probably, I don't think this is un, unfair to say, they're mostly run by, people who are the same demo as the kids who are participating, right? Like middle to upper income white people, right? That's just kind of how it's evolved and where the clubs are. Right. Um, and so at that top level, you know, the, the, there's a disconnect between that and the population that we're serving. Right. So there might, we've seen, Everything during our time working, we've seen application fees for scholarship applications. So you have to pay money to apply for a scholarship, which is just, I, I can't even wrap my mind around the logic there, right? We've seen tryout fees, right? Um, we've seen organizations that try to do the modification and offer scholarships. But then when time comes for a tournament out of town, it's figure it out. You guys have to get a hotel, right? Which is these hidden fees or uniforms, right? Yeah. So within, within there will always be the beast of pay to play. I think there's an element of some groups hopefully will start to have some varying thought leadership and understanding the trickle down. Another core thing that we would see is all of the registration and application forms when we first started working with kids were only in English. So they were asking the kids that we were working with who had families from who had moved from El Salvador 10, five, 10 years ago, spoke very little English to fill out waivers and application, uh, scholarship applications that were just in English here, fill it out. And it's just not, it's not meeting them where they are, right? Um, so I think a modification for some of those groups could be done with thought leadership. The other side of it is I do think our model and how we're doing things, there is a space for it and it needs to happen. And it's not just because of the model with which we're doing it. It's also the social emotional aspect of the kids that we work with not just going on to a team with kids who don't look like them or on different backgrounds than them and having a holistic, comfortable space to really grow and, and feel comfortable as opposed to feeling like, you know, the black or Latino kid on a team of white kids. And hopefully that starts to even out in some kind of capacity. So it's not just a one person or a two, but creating an environment that is really conducive and welcoming for this population it's crucial because not just of you know feeling comfortable but the off-field services also which i would throw out that i didn't mention before you know we've seen i mentioned the health and fitness aspect we bring in a strength and conditioning coach because we saw the kids that we were working with playing on travel teams and after their sessions those kids would go to their private strength and conditioning coach and our kids would just be falling behind, right? We have um, financial literacy training because our kids do not have parents they can go to and ask them to talk to them about what student loans will look like or what the difference between credit and debit is, college applications, right? All these things and extra services that I think are traditionally associated with community organization we're integrating them as well. So I think it's a long winded way of saying, I think there's three pieces, one pay to play. There are some clubs that will never change Two, I think there is, there are, there are ways to modify um, kind of the existing system. And then three, I think there'll always be a lane for kind of what we're doing. Yeah. I think it's really interesting. You mentioned some of the, the earlier parts about being 
the one person that doesn't look like the rest of your team or doesn't have the experiences that the rest of your team does. And there's there seems to be an intersection in American life, in corporate life. I know in my full-time job, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a true step that we haven't really thought about before, but it is about making sure that there are spaces where people can feel themselves and can grow into their best version of themselves. And even putting it in the soccer realm, I just read this morning about Greg Berhalter coming in and kind of changing the interior of the team from the first go and just building an environment where people are excited to go to the national team camps where with Jurgen Klinsmann, people right. were on edge and had tension when they went to the national team camps. So I just think what you're saying is kind of where we're at now. And it could have been something that could be left behind for a lot of kids to just not be in a comfortable environment to grow and learn some of those very initial skills that you need to when you're a kid. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a multi-layered issue. And I'm going to give you an example because a lot of people will say, well, that's great. Like, how do we do that? Right. We have put an emphasis on trying to have our staff. Obviously, I'm a white person. I don't look like most of our kids, almost any of our kids, right? I'm, you know, most soccer clubs are run and most of the coaches look like me. We've put a real emphasis on hiring black and Latino coaches um, so that the kids see real reference points. They can speak their language. We're bringing in a number of our alumni coaches for coaching training to start coaching the younger kids because we've seen that it's really difficult, particularly on the women's side, to hire a high-level Latina women's coach, right? And that is that is the trickle-up that we're talking about, mm -hmm. the baseline, the entry, barriers to entry. There are all these kind of steps that make it so that it, the end product and, you know, our, our higher level ecosystem, right? Our soccer ecosystem looks a certain way or the decisions are made a certain way. It's because of that really base level. So there are a few different things that go into that as well. I'm curious as to what you think the impact is on the higher level national team. Like, what does this issue actually do to the players and the development that the team could potentially look like if we had a better system in place than pay to play. I mean, so anybody watching this, don't roll your eyes and think that I'm saying all our kids are like, <laughs> you know, going to the national team. Like we have some talent. This is players, a very but... optimistic channel and community yeah, that yeah, we're yeah, trying yeah. to build. <laughs> no, but you know, I, the way I say it to, to people is if you look at any profession, um, you know, like I said earlier, if you have the entire population to choose from, you are much likelier to select the very best people. It's not to say that the people who are being selected now wouldn't be part of that selection. But if you're selecting from 10, 20 percent of the population, what is what's happening to the rest of them? Right. You know, I saw an article in Forbes, I think it was, that was. Um, detailing two sisters, the Muis sisters on the Olympic team, on the Olympic women's team. Um, and the article, kind of the high level overview was like what the parents did to like make this possible. An incredible con accomplishment and nothing to be taken away from them. But the core <laughs> piece of it that there was a lot of Twitter chatter around and a nugget was pulled out was they spent like $10,000, $20,000 on the daughters to play. And so if you look at that, it's nothing again. It's nothing against them. But you can't, you can't say, you can't truly believe that there's not one kid in this population of kids who aren't participating, who aren't entering that, that way because of lack of resources that shouldn't even get a look. Right. Like, and so it's, it's simple math to us. I think it's, you widen the pool, you make access greater, the talent will go up. Same thing with science or math or professors. Right. And, you know, it's something that 
that when you really look at kind of the social, um, economical aspect at the core of what we do and at the core of what we're talking about, it is replicable within our society. It's just we focus on soccer because it's what we love and we've seen it super up close, you know? Yeah. I think all the things that you're saying are things that I would say as part of as a hiring manager at my full-time job. And it is applicable to objective hiring practices and corporations that the more diverse your talent pool is to choose from, the more successful you'll be as a company. And that is directly applicable to a team of anything, including right. soccer players. Yeah. And when, when you're, that's exactly right. And when you're, when you're creating a system at the lowest level, at the entry point, that inherently, you know, 80% of the people can't walk through the turnstile, then, yeah, you're going to select from a smaller group of people. Even on that level, I remember a story about Clint Dempsey. It's a tragic story about how his sister, who was going to go pro as a tennis player, passed away. And only because of that were, were his parents able to fund his soccer playing mm-hmm. and his practices. And they couldn't do both. They couldn't fund both of their children's sports. So Clint Dempsey never would have been available for the U.S. if that wasn't the case. And it's just even at that level where you might be from all of the right places and have all the right things in place, it still might not be available to you because of the barrier to entry. I would also add, and this is part of the nuance that for everybody who does the the media, it's pay to play. Here's another layer of it that we've seen up close is <clears throat> there might be, I don't know, there might be somebody who's playing pro soccer right now from the U.S. who got a, you know, who wouldn't have been able to participate but got a scholarship or started playing on a team when they were 10 years old. I'm using this as an example because we had a a young lady who started playing on a travel team when she was 11. The vast majority of people who start playing travel within our system are starting at six, seven years old. And when you enter at 11, 12 years old, you're four years behind, you're three years behind or of real technical coaching. So you could say, you know, we don't know what the real potential level, the real capacity level is, if even for the kids who were bringing in kind of at a later date, because they've lost out on three years or four years. Um, So that's just another element. It's why we we started kind of with older kids, just because it was our critical mass. And now we're trying to go younger and younger and younger, because we're seeing this huge gap form in development between, you know, seven and 11 years old. I know in early education studies, they talk about those first few years of education being kind of the foundation for everything else. And if you're behind in that foundational phase, you're then much more likely to be behind in the next phases of your life. Is that similar to what you've seen in the soccer world? So I have a very specific example of this from somebody who knows a lot more about soccer than I do. So I'm going to share it. Um, before open goal was kind of formalized, we were doing some work in the community, um, with a partner organization of ours, DC scores. And we had, um, uh, coaches from Manchester United came over and did like a a camp clinic day. Right. And we're showing different things to us. Um, and the young lady that I just talked about was, uh, nine years old at the time. And all of the kids in our community came out to be coached by these Manchester United coaches. And this was everybody from, she was probably kind of on the lower end of age, all the way up to like 16 year olds. Right. And (laughs) in their mind, you know, the 14, 15, 16 year old, they're doing step over and stuff. They're trying to like, they're trying to get a contract. It's like, you're not (laughs) getting the contract today. Um, And one of the coaches came up to me and said, pointed at her. She was nine years old. She was playing against much taller people. She, he said, who does she play for? And I said, she's not playing for anything. He said, you need to get her somewhere to play. And we started talking and he said that they are told within whatever, if it's their academy or the club or part of his system, whatever it is, 
said between the ages of eight and 11, I believe, um, kids develop or do not develop like a very unique athletic movement gene or something like that. Um, he said, you can tell between eight and 11, if they develop it, they can be like a real player because they move differently. Um, and if they don't, then they're out. Um, and he said, she's, she has, she's the only person here who has that. So she was not being trained, right? But she had that. And so the development side, yeah, they're developing between those kind of young seven to 10, 11. And then they're playing catch up if they're not getting, if they're not getting coaching to that point. So, you know, I just bring that example up because I don't, don't get, I'm not a soccer expert. I grew up playing youth soccer. I love soccer. I work with our kids. It's why my co founder, Amir, played MLS. I kind of let him handle our, coaching curriculum and things like that um, and our overall club aspect. But those are things that are super clear to coaches at the highest, highest level internationally. Um, so they shouldn't be left on us. So. Just to kind of wrap up here and I'll give an opportunity to plug the open goal and talk about what's next, but can you just give the listeners and the watchers an idea of what is next and kind of, anything optimistic to be thinking about when we think about the pay to play system versus what you're talking about and trying to build, like what does the future landscape for us soccer look like? Um, man, I, I really, I hope there are more disruptors like us or, or, or people who want to get behind us because I'd love to kind of paint you a rosy picture of all this stuff that we see that's changing, but we, we really don't. Um, we're seeing even more of a commercialization already. Um, companies that are running the camps, companies that are, that you have to book through for travel, right? Like these are all business elements. Amir said it best. It calls it like the underground youth soccer economy. It's like this beast. It's a beast. And, and unless, unless there are groups and organizations, and there are, there are other organizations that do similar work to ours, um, obviously South Bronx, a lot of people know about. I think they do great work. Um, you know, a number of other organizations, DC Scores I mentioned, which is, is a little less focused on high-level soccer, but they're really focused on access at, at the youth level, which is awesome. And they feed our program as well. Um, but I think, you know, I, I go back to what I first started saying. It's, it's not a knee jerk, Hey, and pay to play because it is so deep rooted. Nobody's going to wake up one day and flip, flick a light switch and, and pay to play is going to be done. It's got to be unique, innovative solutions. It's got to be investment in communities and community organizations it's got to be the right people. Can't be like sending, you know, somebody in and saying, we're going to do it this way. Like soccer is happening, you know, like soccer is happening in different ways and different forms at the youth level. Um, I think what we've tried to do to this point is we know, you know, we know the leaders of the Salvadorian youth leagues. Right. We know all the guys who play pickup. Right. Like we're bridging that gap. and and kind of creating a pipeline into the more formalized system, but breaking down the barriers and people coming up with creative solutions to create more access, create more equity. And it starts with, yeah, it starts with money, right? It starts with looking at your local tournament and saying, why is it a thousand dollars to enter? It looks like looking at our, our, our cards that we order that cost $25 a player. If you have four teams, which we do, $2,500. Um, the fees stack up. Um, and it's not just associated with one thing. It's these tentacles of, of the system. So um, hope you, and people get behind us, but I hope truly that, you know, um, other organizations will become disruptors and then, and then groups who are doing things a certain way and have been doing them a certain way who are interested in truly like, working to make it better and make it more accessible. There are ways, I think, if they started thinking through things or bringing in someone, 
from an outside perspective or from a community to really talk through what that looks like, that's kind of the best way to bridge the gap as we go forward. I mean, talk about a message to fire people up and be excited about maybe overcoming the pessimistic side of pay to play. I think maybe that's a good time to kind of wrap up and say, how do we help? What is your organization? How do we help you? How do we help other organizations like you? Yeah, so I, our organization's Open Goal Project. You can find us at Open Goal Project on Twitter and Instagram, most, most heavy on Instagram and Facebook, opengoalproject.org. Um, you can donate there. You can reach out for partnership opportunities there. Um, I think more than anything, like it's, we get a lot of notes of people who want to help. Um, and I think what we're, we're trying to do is we don't quite honestly, we don't need a, another, a volunteer coach. We don't need volunteer coaches, right? We need people who are going to run their own fundraisers, right? Or people who are going to say, Hey, you know, I'm going to work in my community to offer a free tournament. What does that look like? Do you know somebody who runs, you know, the local, you know, shop that wants to get behind something, right? Create more access, create more partnerships within your own community. Um, it's hard though. It is, it's a beast. I can't say that enough. It's a beast because um, it takes a lot of time. It's taken us a lot of time to get to this point. It's been six years, but honestly, it's been like, I, I don't even know how many hours, right? Like, um, and so I think just being aware, awareness is the first step. Um, and then just start looking around at those competitions, at those leagues, like start the things I mentioned, the nuanced elements of it, start thinking through those and keeping an eye out to see where they are and and see if there's ways that you can, you know, help make a change in some kind of capacity, whether that's creating a new idea or solution at the ground level. So, I don't know. I wish I could give you more direct <laughs> thing, but we're trying. We're trying out here. And obviously, um, you know, there are a number of great organizations, some of which I mentioned that always need help as well so yeah i mean that's a great message and i hope everyone watching has been able to get something out of this to how they can help their community and i know this is silly but it's the youtube algorithm if you guys like this video it will go to more people and that might just get to someone that knows a shop owner knows a way to to get around this um, Everyone watching this in honor of Jake and I being cousins, send this video to all of your cousins, whether it's <laughs> one or 20 cousins. I like that. Just subject That's line, cousin love, hashtag uh, Yanks talking, Yanks go talking. Hopefully we have some Irish people out there with uh, 100 <laughs> cousins. <laughs> but, uh, Simon, co-founder of Open Goal Project, but most importantly, my my beloved cousin, Thank you for coming on the channel Great and talking time. about this. Thanks.